Hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, the third session of today's uh, Retail Bulletin sessions, the Future of Retail Marketing Conference, brought to you virtually on this Wednesday, the 15th of September. I'm Darren. We're back with another new panel this afternoon um, to talk about personalizing the customer experience. Thank you so much if you've joined us again after the sessions that took place this morning, and thank you for your interaction and questions so far. If you've just joined us, also, you're very welcome as well, and you're in for a great panel ahead with these lovely people that you see on the screen with me. I'll ask them to introduce themselves in just a moment, but we do want you to get involved. Um, and so there is a Q&A button somewhere on your screen, depending on what device you are using. Please do get involved, use that device to ask questions, and me as the moderator will make sure that they come to life for you. I promise to get your, make sure that every single question gets answered. So I'm Darren, I'll moderate the session today. I'm, um, I have a few hats other than uh, doing these sessions for the TRB. Um, I am the exec chairman of Scrubbed, the non-exec chairman of Liberty Music PR, um, MD of Williams Harding, um, to name but a few. Um, so Williams Harding works with a couple of really interesting clients, one in the world of chocolate and one in orthodontics right now. Um, and the Scrubbed and Liberty PR haps uh, keep me very busy as well. But another bunch of busy people are sitting here waiting to be introduced. And so without further ado, I'm going to go over to them and ask them to tell you a little bit about themselves. Um, and then we can get cracking on with what will be a fantastic panel. So in no, in no particular order, Nadima, I'm going to start with you, please. Welcome. Tell us about you. Hi everyone, great to be here. Um, thanks for the Retail Bulletin for organizing this. Um, where do I start? So my background was in investment banking and then I qualified at the London School of Beauty. So completely different. And um, I launched a retail company, a price comparison company in beauty and it's called My Beauty Matches. And basically we do what match.com does, but for beauty products. <laughs> So we help match people to the right beauty products for them and then discover them at the right price for them, which is what I'm here to discuss, how we apply personalization. And then we also built an AI company which helps other beauty companies use Amazon type product recommendation technology for themselves as well. And it's a white label solution. So that's me. And sorry, I'm out of breath. I just came. Um We've worked, we've worked together on a panel before, so great to have you back and good Thank to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, someone else I've worked with on a panel before. Hello, Shalom. How are you doing? Hello, Darren. I'm fine. Thank you. It's great to be here. Welcome back. Tell us about you. Um, it's great to be here, everyone. My name is Shalom Lloyd. I am the founder of a company called Naturally Tribal Skincare. Um, it's a unique um, British natural skincare company and we import personally selected ingredients from Africa where we have a facility and empowering Afri African women and we bring this ingredients to the UK manufacture test formulate and package here so our products are really targeted people with skin conditions people who are looking for clean beauty green beauty people who just love their skin as nature intended so we're trying to change the narrative in terms of what um, the definition of sort of natural clean Green, green or even blue skincare is so yeah great to be here to talk about personalization thanks for having me welcome and i've seen lots of uh stuff on social around your relationship with harris beauty i hope it's going well for you oh it's going really well thank you good 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 stuff well welcome back uh sheila hello over in canada tell us how are you uh, to, t sorry tell us how you are of course and who you are i meant to say as well well it's a pleasure to be here thank you um, so my name is Sheila Stoneham, and I've had, after several years um, of being chief marketing officer for some Fortune 500 companies, everything from Telco to um, Shoppers Drug Mart, which is a, a large drugstore chain um, here in Canada, and then in the U.S. as um, chief marketing officer for Chico's, um, which is a women's specialty retailer. I started my own business, um, which is focused on weighted wearables. So it's called Power Warehouse, like what you wear, warehouse. And we sell weighted vests, weighted belts, which are unique to the market because they are extremely comfortable. They have variable weight, which is personalized for you and your personal, what you're doing in your 
health state, what you're doing that day. Um, and they're also chic. So they're, they're comfortable, they're chic, and they are variable in terms of their weight. We also have a number of other accessories and so on. We're selling to all the major sporting goods retailers here in Canada. We're soon to be launching Academy in the US and we're with Weight Watchers, which is very exciting as well. So we are, um, oh, and soon in the Middle East. So we have not quite cracked the UK market yet, but we're in the process. And I think that personalization will go a long way to helping us um, achieve that goal. So I look forward to speaking more about that later on. Absolutely. And the UK is ready for you, Sheila. No problem at all. Come and see us. Um, next on the list, Emily, welcome back. We've also done a panel together before. So how are you doing? Hi, Darren. Um, yeah, really great to be here. So my name's Emily. I'm Senior Marketing Manager for Lucky Saint. We're an alcohol-free lager brand. Um, and interestingly, I'm kind of coming at this personal personalisation topic from a different angle because we only have one product we only have our superior unfiltered lager and we kind of want to be to guinness what guinness is to stout we want lucky saint to be to alcohol free beer um, but when it comes to personalization it's really important for us to make our customers feel like the marketing that we are kind of serving them is personalized to them to their interests to what stage they are in their relationship with us as a brand so it'd be really good to chat to you guys and and you know, discuss how we've achieved that with a really small team and kind of giving that personal experience or giving the illusion of a really personalized experience. Now, I have to confess, I'm more of an ale guy, but I know you kindly uh, sent me some Lucky Saint to try after we last worked together. And it's really clean and refreshing, actually. So I used to drink lager back in the day and I sort of got older and started drinking ale, but I was impressed. So oh, good work. Nice. Good work okay. indeed. And I'm Thanks. glad to see Glad to hear things are going so well there as well. Um, last but not least, Alan over in Texas, no less, um, from Nuxio, um, our sponsors today as well. So thank you, sir. Tell us about you. Well, it's great to be, uh, to be back on the panel here, Darren. Uh, thanks for having me back. Uh, and uh, yeah, my name is Alan Porter. I'm the product marketing um, director for Nuxio. We are a content services platform provider that specializes in uh, managing your digital assets and your product assets. Um, we have a big presence in retail, um, fashion, and uh, cosmetics companies helping drive a lot of their online personalization experiences. So. Well, welcome, sir, and thanks again for your sponsorship. So we've got the UK, Canada, and America, Texas covered today. So we, yeah, we're doing well. We've got some uh, transatlantic coverage going on for today's panel, so all good. Um, and just to say, uh, please do use your time wisely uh, to talk to this panel through the Q&A button. Uh, no question uh, should be left unanswered. I'll make sure that every single one is cleared. So uh, find that Q&A button and don't be afraid to ask a question. I promise you we will hear it and we will answer it. Um, before we start, the dog is asleep right behind me. Who knows what could happen? She may make an appearance. She did right at the beginning before we went live but she seems to have conked out behind me after a lunchtime walk. So uh, if we see a sudden furry friend arrive on screen, you've been warned, she's called Scamp, and for regular viewers of the TRB, um, she does tend to make an appearance. So there you go. And in this virtual world we now live in, to our panellists, if your children, partners, furry friends want to run onto the screen as well, bring them in, they're all welcome. We don't care these days, it's absolutely fine. Let's get going, shall we? Nadima, I'm going to kick off with you, if I may. Um, you're right in the centre of my screen, so it seems a good place to start. Um, let's chat. What increase, uh, increase in engagement have you seen, sort of before and after personalisation, when you've been creating these seamless experiences? Yeah, so just to give context, it's different for different things. So we do personalisation on our actual website. So, um, like I said, My Beauty Matches is a price comparison website. People fill in a quiz about their information and we match them to the right products. Um, so we obviously do personalization there. And then we'll also do personalized emails. So we don't just send an email saying, hey, these are the top shampoos selling on My Beauty Matches. We say, hey, we know you have this concern for that concern and for your age range or for where you live, we find these are the right shampoos for you. So in terms of email, just to give you an example, previous open rates could have been anything between two to five percent. And after we implemented not just personalization, but beauty specific personalization. So we know ingredients matters or seasonality matters or 
texture or color matters, given that information, um, our open rates kind of went up between 30 to 40 percent, which were incredibly high because they're hyper, hyper personalized, not just with the name, but also taking into account everything else. Um, in terms of website personalization, we have seen anything between 30 to 400 percent increase in conversion rates. A lot of that depends on what the brand is, their brand equity, and if it's a retailer or not. So again, on My Beauty Matches, we have some big retailers on board, you know, whether it's Harrods or something like that. And then we also have some smaller brands or retailers that maybe are not as well known to the UK audience. We're actually, actually yeah. UK and US. Um, so it's very much dependent on who's listed with us. And then their own offerings in terms of, you know, delivery, time of delivery, price of delivery. So that's where we're seeing um, conversion rates or an improvement. And then in terms of beauty matching engine, we have seen when we work with clients, it's a white label solution to allow them to enhance personalization. So to give you an example, in six months, we might have seen an increase in 40, 50 percent in conversion rates. But then after eight months, it was an increase of about 70 something percent, because obviously there's a machine learning element happening. And it's, again, very specific to the industry. So there's a lot of personalization companies can do, whether it's email or on the website or in store. But it's a whole different element when you do it specific for your industry, taking into account the data points, the touch points, how people shop there. Um, for instance, is there a stronger touch point? I mean, is there one that really stands out, a stronger touch point, like mobile, for example? Is that stronger? Yeah, so mobile is definitely, I think, stronger for everybody. And, you know, that just goes to show, again, like I know I'm talking a bit about beauty here, but I think it's relevant for every industry. When there's more clicks to check out, you have less conversion rates. So as a customer, if you can deliver to your customer, real-time customized content or personalized product recommendations which are based on their skin tone or you know their preferences then there's fewer clicks and on mobile people generally don't click that much and when people are shopping on mobile suddenly you get a message on your whatsapp right so then you can quickly like switch off and you know have a contact switching as well so what we do for instance is we ensure if somebody is clicking on a red lipstick all the recommendations you see below would be for red lip liner or red lipstick. Or if someone's clicking on a foundation, which is for dark skin tone, we are not going to recommend them foundations for other skin tones or concealer. So that's essentially what generally we do, you know, for our clients at Beauty Matching Engine. And then on My Beauty Matches, we have over 4,000 brands. The color recommendation engine is a bit different there, but the more you personalize it, fewer the clicks they are on mobile. So we actually saw on mobile, there was actually a higher uplift than on desktop, especially because there's usually a lot of distraction as well. And then you have to like scroll a lot and stuff. So if you can personalize the upsells or you can personalize the content, there's fewer clicks and fewer clicks means faster checkout. That's a really interesting insight. And I think that's about that, you know, customer gets where they want to get to quicker, right? Yeah. And so it's remove some of that friction and noise on the on the on the journey to it thank you for that i'm going to come back to you shortly thank you very much shalom let's come to you you've got uh, your products in retail and e-commerce how do you ensure consistency um, in personalization across those different channels darren can you hear me sorry my internet sounds seems unstable can you hear me yeah i can hear you yep oh fantastic can did you, you hear the question that? okay i Oh, you're frozen a bit there now. We might, we might have have a frozen shalom. We might have to move on. Oh, hang on, you're back. I'm back. Okay, do you want me to ask the question again? Please. No worries. These things happen. We can we can work through this stuff. It's no problem. Um, your products are in uh, e-com and retail stores. How do you ensure consistency across that personalization piece in different channels? Oh, frozen again. We may have to come back to Shalom. We might have a, a technical issue. Yeah, we've definitely frozen now. Shalom, if you can hear this. Oh, you've just come back. 
what we had to, can you hear me now? I'm yeah. So I mean, what we had to do was really take a step back and define the market. In the beauty industry, as we know, I think it's worth about 400 billion. We had to look at skin conditions worth about 17 billion, which is what our market is focused on. And then even take that down further to say natural remedies worth about 3 billion. So identify what are we targeting in terms of market and then look at who's buying this stuff. It's the nature lover, the planet lover, people with skin conditions. So we had to actually tailor our personalized messaging and assets to make them consistent across all these customers that I've just mentioned, and then translate in that so that when they come onto our e-commerce platform, what they see, they can relate to, it gives them the information, they cho the choice, it empowers them. And then when they work, walk into a store, they have the same information. So that personalization based on our customer portfolio is really important because that was the basis of us building material and assets, both for online, we can they reach it very, very quickly. And when they go in store, they're able to see the same images, the same messaging, um, that consistency, driving it home over and over and over again. I hope I haven't frozen again. No, no, you're there. We got you. We got the whole of that. So whatever you did to the Wi-Fi, maybe kicked it under the desk or something, that definitely worked. So uh, you, are, you are back and we captured the whole answer. Thank you so much for that. And we will come back to you shortly. Keep kicking it as well, yeah? So you stay moving. Perfect. Um, Sheila, I'm going to come over to Canada now, if I may, um, and talk to you. What do you view as the top issue preventing retailers offering a personalized experience? Why, why can't they do it? I think that um, there are a few reasons. I mean, one of, the, one of the key reasons is that it is not something which um, is viewed by everyone at the senior level as a priority because it takes it takes a village to create a personalized experience and in big companies and Alan I know you probably can speak to this as well you know in big companies um, personalization is not necessarily viewed as uh, it's important but there may be other more pressing matters that take that seem to knock it off and, and because the investment is so enormous in terms of human resources and financial resources to make sure that they've got the right, um, that the data is centralized so that they have one view of the customer regardless of where they shop or where they interact with the brand, they have one view of the customer. So that if you don't have that data, you don't have it be able to manipulate that data and to understand the customer on a personal level, you can offer a personalized experience. So there has to be clear and fair alignment at the senior levels to influence with all key stakeholders that this is a priority for financial and human resources. So that you've got the right technology, you've got, um, you're prioritizing your, um, your, your, your tech stack, your tools, you're combining the experiences so that you're creating a personal experience, not just in store, but online, um, and you're making the investment. And for a lot of retailers that are legacy um, bricks and mortar retailers, this is a huge issue because as they've invested to go online, the, the e-commerce experience is still a fraction of what they sell in bricks and mortar. And so, to, so, so the profitability of that channel is not necessarily there yet. I mean, we've been talking, we've been listening to those who are pure plays, you know, who started or have started at, you know, e-commerce. And that's, and that is, the ideal state, frankly, in many ways, is is that you start you start with with that and then and move forward. But for others, they're just trying to they're trying to allocate resources. And as I said, it takes it it takes a it takes a village or a whole um, senior leadership team in order to make that happen because of the resources required. What I didn't mention was I talked about financial and I talked about human resources in terms of the technology, human resources in terms of making it a priority in terms of what they're doing, their strategic levers but also there's a legal aspect to it too which is balancing privacy with personalization so people want you to a personalized experience but they don't want it in a way that is creepy nor nor do you want to cross the line um you know just in terms of ethics so when i worked yeah. at Shepherd's drug mart we had 
you know, which is like the Walgreens of, of the US or Boots of, Can of, of the UK. So we had front of store, so convenience foods, you know, people were eating, for loyalty program, you knew what, what uh, prescriptions they were, they were taking and you knew what OTCs and so on they were, they were you could tell, uh, um, you could easily tell their health state. Um, although we kept separate, very deliberately separate um, data uh, portals for um, pharmacy versus front of house what we call front of house, which is convenience and OTCs and so on. But we had to do that and we had very strict guidelines in place. That's all human resources required, including yeah. people to make all that happen. So in order to offer a truly personalized experience that is positive, a positive personalized experience that is also you know, um, profitable in the end, one needs to have clear alignment from the senior leadership team. So if there's one takeaway, it would be, this is a mandate. And how is everyone in every department going to help support that initiative? Yeah, and, and everyone everyone feeling like everyone is believing in it as well. Um, yeah, and yes. need to do it. Thank you, Sheila, so much indeed. Take a sip of whatever drink you're drinking there early in the morning, take a rest, and uh, I'll come back to you later. Emily, uh, coming to you now, we've talked a bit on the other webinars today about small, small businesses and startups. And, and as a, a small business yourself, how do you give customers a feeling of personalization that's achievable within you know, your resources? Yeah, so I think it can feel really intimidating, this idea of personalization when you're a really small business, because as Sheila says, it is it does take a village and, and it's a huge effort to make every single customer have a personal experience. And for a company of our size and for the fact that we only have one product, that's virtually impossible, kind of making every single customer you know, personalizing our marketing to every single individual. Um, so I think there's two things you can do to kind of create this illusion of personalization. Um, and the first is really good segmentation in your database um, and making sure that you fully understand at what point in their purchasing journey your database is, because you definitely don't want to be contacting somebody who just bought a 48 pack and asking if they want to refill their fridge after a week because they're not at that point in their journey. Um, and that might not refer to personalization from a point of view of their interests or it's, it's more kind of quite basic personalization, but it's still very important because I think we've all been in that position where a brand contacts us and is asking us to do something which just doesn't fit in with the way that we've just interacted with their brand. Um, so I think really, really tight segmentation of your CRM database is the first thing that you can do. So, and even on a very basic level of just having active customers who've purchased in the last three months, lapsed customers who've purchased, but not in the last six months and dormant customers who are on your database, but have never purchased. It can be as simple as that just to kind of get you on that road to personalizing your approach. And I think the second thing you can do is to really understand your customer. And that sounds like such an obvious thing to say, but we as a company, we don't really think in terms of demographics like age or gender, we think about mindset. And I think if you try to understand and get under the skin of your customer and you really understand what they like and what they're interested in and think about what is the unifying thing across all your customers. So for us being alcohol free, it's health, every single one of our customers has some interest in improving their health or making a really good change, even if it's a small change, like switching alcoholic for alcohol-free beer. And we find that when we do health-related content, so it might be the best places to go for a cycle where there's a pub stop or something like that, a pub stop that stops Lucky Saint, that those are the kind of emails that get upwards of 40% open rates because th that person's thinking, how do they know I like cycling? There's like, uh, I love this brand. They really, they really understand me and they get me, but it's having those conversations, potentially doing a survey with your top customers and understanding their needs and their wants and their interests. That's something that you can then filter down into all your consumers. And there might be the odd person who doesn't like cycling, but I think it is important to really understand your customers and understand what they're interested in and what they like. Um, we find that recipe content performs really well, for example, but we find that when we, um, we did a piece on, I think the best places to, I think it was like theatre shows or something with, with um, the UK opening up again and it just didn't perform. And I think it's because that wasn't based in any insight about our customers. So 
great segmentation of your database, number one, and also really getting under the skin of, of your consumer so that your content feels personal, even if it's going to all of, all of your database. It's interesting, isn't it, that understanding the customer piece is such a, a strap line or a buzzword and things that's chucked around HQs, you know, we understand our customer and in my experience, it's not often actually a truly lived out. So it's really good to hear your insight on that. And uh, it is definitely one of those strap lines that isn't never truly delivered. So thank you for that. Alan, you've been sitting very patiently in Texas, hopefully having a coffee because it's early morning there for you. Um, so I'm going to come to you, if I, if I may, please, and talk about imagery. Um, so how important is delivery of the right images as part of the personalised customer experience? It's actually vital, but I actually want to take a step back and pick up on something that Sheila said around. Sure. Um, because we deal with a lot of very large companies. Um, and often we find the personalization initiatives is something of a top-down initiative. Um, you know, somebody in the C-suite says we've got to deliver personalized experiences, but they very rarely define what that actually means in terms of what does the word personalization mean? Are we talking one-to-one -one individual personalization? Are we talking geographic? Are we talking, I like what Emily said, a, a mindset rather than a demographic. Um, I think that's great. Um, are we talking, um, like I said, geography? Are we talking a culture? Um, are we talking a particular group or um, of people? Um, so very often we find there's a complete mismatch between what the top down executives expect and what actually happens to your point earlier about people saying we understand who our customers are and they actually very rarely don't because there's a, it comes down to, again, what Sheila said, needing the resources to actually do it. And we find actually that uh, one of the things that often gets missed, even if they do uh, have customer um, data platforms and they're mining the data is actually the imagery that goes with the messages that they're sending out. So they, we find a lot of cases, people may be sending out personalized text or personalized tweets or social media, and the images are actually a complete mismatch for the personalization. Um, just to give an, exa an, an example from my previous life, when I worked for a uh, manufacturer of construction equipment, we had a very nice geographic uh, campaign that was sent out to all our local dealers and the dealer in Saudi Arabia got a nice email with pictures of snow plows attached to it. Right, okay. Um, but the email was nicely personalized for their region, but the images were a complete mismatch because somebody had just picked, you know, um, a picture with a certain piece of equipment on it, but it happened to have a snow plow on the front of it. Not a good thing to send to Saudi Arabia. So what we tend to find is a lot of the imagery that goes with in personalization does not have the right metadata attached to it, does not have the right information attached to it about where it can be used, what campaigns it relates to, um, and also where it shouldn't be used. Um, somebody already mentioned cultural things as well. The cultural impact of imagery can be really important on a personalized um, on personalization as well. Um, and Nadima mentioned seasonality. Um, working with a lot of the, uh, the major fashion brands, that's something that I've become very aware of um, over the last few years is how important seasonality is to the imagery that is actually going out with the personalized messages. So it, it's, it's a question of making sure that the imagery that you're delivering actually speaks to the customer, not just in terms of, is that the product I have, but is that my background? Is that my geography? Is that is this the season I'm working in? If you're selling globally, you know, fall in the US is not fall in Australia. Um, huh. yeah. Things like that, you know. So you just just you you've really got to think beyond. Is this just a picture of the product, or is this just a picture of a customer using the product? But you've got to think around a lot of the the data that fits around that and mine and put the metadata to it. So often the information about the the image is as important or more important than the image itself to make sure that you're actually delivering something that you will get an empathic uh, reaction to when you're actually delivering the image. So, yeah, I, and um, we were talking about mobile earlier. Obviously, imagery is very important on mobile. Um, mobile is, is very much a, an image visual driven um, interaction these days, uh, with, particularly if, you, if you're marketing through social. Um, if you don't have um, an image or a video clip or something, it's probably just going to fly by. So you have to make sure it's the right image at the right time on the right device and it actually speaks to somebody culturally, timely, uh, and, and gives them that empathic reaction. So. 
it's bewildering to me that so much you know so much thought and work would go into the words if you like and then someone wouldn't think to actually link the words to the image um but yeah well, unfortunately they tend to find a they, they just find a, a search term and go search for an image and then just oh that's the right image well you know that's that's got a i don't know the right that's got a t-shirt in it we'll just throw it on there and you know. <laughs> fair um, enough yeah thank you sir great insight so we are halfway through already the time flies um you're very quiet audience so far um someone has just said uh thank you very much uh, they've got an emergency to have to dial off but they're asking for a copy of the recording later so they've obviously enjoyed um, of what they've heard so far i don't know who you are but i hope everything's okay and thank you for that little message um, but yeah do use the q a button if you want to ask our panelists anything uh, they are here to answer your questions um, and i'm sure you'll agree the content and insight has been compelling so far Nadima, I'm going to come back to you, please, if I may. Um, speed. How do you deliver fast and easy, personalised and intuitive self-service as customer expectations change? Oh, wow. That's such a loaded question. Um, <laughs> there, I guess there's two things to it. Um, one part is obviously being able to do it from a technical point of view and be able to do it within your team, within the company. And then it is how does that actually come to life and improve the customer experience? So for the customer, I think, you know, we kind of live in the world now, which is very much instant gratification. Like if I'm hungry, I'll just go to Deliveroo, you know, um, you know what I mean? Like we just want instant groceries, you name it, we get exactly, it. Instantly. Exactly. Yeah. You know, Amazon has spoiled us as much as we have a love hate relationship with it, but it's really true. So the same goes for the customer shopping experience, whether it's in store, whether it's online, whether it's on mobile, you know, you don't expect to have to do 10 different clicks to get a personalized experience. Um, you don't expect to have to, you know, do like often what I will see on a website, I'll literally add a foundation to my basket and then I'll go on the checkout page and it will recommend me other foundations just because they're the top seller, which makes no sense, right? If you're really about wanting to upsell and you really want to improve your customer experience, you really have to think what is best for the customer. Um, and of course it might take some time. And, you know, like it was already mentioned on this call by Shilag is that you know, if you want to personalize, you have to like take a whole army within a company <laughs> to advocate for it and put this together, et cetera, et cetera. But I think the first part of delivering a fast and seamless personal shopping experience for the customer is knowing what exists out there and what you can do about it. And yeah. I think a big part of that comes about educating within the team and understanding or talking to experts. Um, once you know that, you can then offer a seamless personalized shopping experience. Generally personalized, at least in my world, because you know I live in a world of data and artificial intelligence, it's really about one-to-one -one personalization. Now, what would be recommended to you would be very different to what's recommended to me, it would be very different what's recommended to Emily or Shalom. So um, I don't think you can just say, hey, these are the best sellers or just personalize the name because we have we live in different climates, we have different skin types, different skin tone, et cetera, et cetera. So in terms of the first step, that is the most important one about getting informed. And there's a lot of personalization tools out there. If you're on Shopify, there's lots of Shopify apps. If you're on Magento, if you're on WordPress, there's lots of different apps out there. And then there's also a question of what you want to pers personalize, right? You can personalize emails, you can personalize content. You can personalize your product recommendations, et cetera. And it all comes down to what is more pressing for any company. And generally it is, let's increase revenue. And the second thing is let's increase average order value. And then the third thing is let's increase loyalty. So at least in fashion, we don't do fashion, but there's a high uh, return rates. So people will buy products and then return it. And it just creates a logistical nightmare. So if you can match people to the right products for them, or you can personalize, you can actually cut down on those costs as a business and enhance the customer experience. From a perspective of what do you do, what do you personalize, 
like you know it was said personalization is not always a number one priority for everybody so it's really about understanding what is it for personalizing content could be something that helps improve engagement it's another plus point to increasing the conversion rate but it's not direct you know often companies have to think if i spend this much money on an influencer how many sales can i generate versus if i spend this much on personalization campaign so the first steps would be to do some easy peasy, like it was mentioned here, you know, personalization. So you can, if you're with Clavio or whatever email system you use, you can just segment your audience. It's very basic. You don't need someone to set it up. Back in the day when I started seven, eight years ago, I used to have a paid intern that used to set it up. So it's really not that difficult to do. Same with personalized ads on Facebook or Instagram. You can learn that in two weeks and it can be done and then it can just be automated. The second thing is, of course, there's this thing about, oh my God, personalization is such a big thing. It's so expensive. But to be honest, it's not that expensive anymore. It's been commoditized. There's some companies that will sell you a personalization service, like, you know, to a company like Clarins globally for half a million a year or to another brand like that, similar size. Or you can use tools which are like 50 quid a month and you don't need to manage. So you really have to do your research and understand what works. So for instance, with My Beauty Matches, on our price comparison website, we have built a technology. The guy who helped me build it is amazing. He built Treatwell, lastminute.com. We have not touched the technology for three years and it still works. And it's just ameliorating all the time, right? With Beauty Matching Engine, we will plug it in on a pharmacy website, on a retailer website like Douglas, and it's a plugin like Google Analytics. They don't need to do anything but provide us a shopping feed and that's it. Then there are other tools that say they're using AI or they're doing personalization, but actually it's an A-B testing tool. So they'll say, okay, we have this audience comes in, show, you know, let's split the audience 50-50. Let's show, I don't know, the first audience a picture of this, the second audience a picture of that, and let's just see what performs better. All this stuff takes a lot of time, a lot of learning, et cetera. So you really want to understand which tools work. That's point one. You know, what are the price points? Like some take 2% commission, some take five, some take 50 quid a month, others take, you know, 5,000 pounds a month. Some are easy to set up, some are not. So that's like a big part. Then you want to think about obviously where you want to do it. And then once you launch it, it's actually not that difficult on personalizing it instantly and dynamically. Now, what I would say, I'll just say this one last thing, is that there's a lot of companies that are doing personalization on the website or email, et cetera. But it's a whole other thing to be able to do it dynamically. So if I have just looked at a face serum and then I'm looking at a shampoo, but I didn't buy the face serum, by the second or third click, I should be recommended another face serum. The same way when you click on something on Facebook, you will see it <clears throat> and again sometimes, right? Because when you just see it once, you might not click on it. But then if you see one more ad of class pass or something, you might click on it. So it's the exact same thing. It needs to also be dynamic. And that's how I would suggest doing it real time. I hope that Thank you so much. And that's, uh, I'm sure there's, there's tons of content in there. So I'm, I'm sure our audience got lots from that. If you do have questions, then please do put them in the q and I can see the first one in. So um, I hear you, I see you, and we'll, we'll get to that question before we end the session today. Thank you. Shalom, coming to you, personalization strategies. What factors have you used to determine yours? Uh, Dan, I think, I mean, there's been so much wonderful nuggets being put out there. I, I kind of love what Alan had said earlier about going back to what is it? Personalization is really recognizing people as individuals, right? What are their strengths? What are their preferences? And putting the power in their hands and hopefully your product at the end of that. Today's consumer, particularly in, in, in the beauty industry, is really savvy, very niche focused because there's a whole barrage of things come in their way. So you really have to stand out. So understanding how to reach and speak to them is really critical, particularly when you're putting a strategy together. You know, things like, who are they? I mean, for us at Naturally Tribal is looking at other customers um, with skin conditions, eczema, psoriasis, where they're going to go to the pharmacies, et cetera. So tailoring it that way. Are there people who uh, traceability, authenticity means a lot to them? There's clean beauty, there's green beauty. In fact, there's now blue beauty. 
So being able to, yeah, blue beauty is people who look at your products and how much, what's the water content? Is it affecting our oceans? It comes up every day. So your strategy has to keep evolving with these new phrases, no matter what they are, because the customer's expectations change depending on the situation. With lockdown, it's like, you know, stress, anxiety. So you tailor that message to, to what they want, vegan, cruelty-free. Um, so I, I think it was, um, I can't remember who said about um, segmentation, but behavior is a big one as well. Um, how, how does it make them feel? And that's what we think about. How do we want our customers to feel? Back to Alan's point, when they see images, I want them to see an image and it's like, oh, I don't need words. That's naturally tribal. So it, it's, it's those kind of things that we take into account when we're building our personalization strategy, how the customer feels at the heart of it. And also being aware of the industry that, oh my goodness, it's changing. Everywhere you go now, you're hearing sustainability, that word ethical sourcing. Um, you're hearing all these things now. Um, and for us, we've been doing it from day one. So it was easy because we had that story, that source the jar story anyway. So these are really the things that we take into account. I mean, I've worked in the pharmaceutical industry for 25 years and personalized healthcare has been something that was battered from senior management, but you know, nobody gives you a, a book to say, here you go, that's how you do it. And the same thing applies here on a daily basis. So really it's recognizing people as individuals. That's the first thing we keep at the fore of our minds. You know, what are their strengths? What are their preferences? And then tailoring everything that we're doing to speak to that. One size does not fit, fit all. We don't want to be everything to absolutely everyone on the planet. It's choosing that niche and saying, I'm focusing on these people. Thank you so much. And this, yeah, the, the whole, um, I only became aware of the blue, the blue beauty thing, um, literally the last couple of weeks. And it's, everything is, there's so many new words, phrases, expectations all the time. You just got to be on it and try and understand how you navigate through it. So yeah, that was definitely new news for me a couple of weeks ago as well. I was like, well, what's that? Thank you so much. Canada calling. I'm coming to you again, Sheila. Um, Legacy loyalty programs. There's lots of them around with retailers. What approach have you seen retailers take with legacy loyalty programs and kind of transition them or evolve them to a successful personalized customer experience? You're on mute. Thank you. The first, first one, $5 fine. Oh, the first one, um, the first thing I'd like to say is that, that um, legacy loyalty programs are something which are a privilege because they, um, particularly if the data is housed in a, in a, in a robust uh, manner. So, you know, it used to be that we, we targeted mass. It was mass, like who's our target? Um, as Shalom said, it's, it's how the customer feels is it's not just what they do anymore that, 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 that matters. And legacy loyalty programs typically reward behavior and what people do and the transactions they make. Now we care more about, also care actually about what, how they feel because what they do is often an output of what they think and feel. So they think they feel they do. So we have to acknowledge all of it. And these legacy loyalty programs, people aren't sure what to do. And there've been some major blunders by, by like large organizations that have taken a bold move of simply removing their loyalty programs where you get points for every time you make a purchase or a certain level of purchase, et cetera. And um, that's, just, that's just not wise. <laughs> That way, it's not the smartest thing one could do. Instead, take the data and think about what the ideal end state is. And this has been just, this has been uh, mentioned a few times um, over the, the course of this morning's discussion, which is what do you want the customer um, to think, feel, and do when they are when they are interacting with your brand? And because th that emotional connection with your brand will. Um, will drive loyalty like no other. The new definition of loyalty, which I think is, is, is centered around personalization. Know me, know my business, know what I do, and then give me relevant data that, um, that and I'll come back. So yeah, you like that? Yeah. So, so, it, so the key is how do you take that data and transition it? Well, I think it's not an either or, I think it's an and. So you take the existing 
database and you start to personalize by demonstrating relevancy through product suggestions. So, you know, know how a customer feels, know their skin type, for example, know their, know, know what country they're in and what kind of uh, climate they're experiencing, show them relevant um, imagery, show them relevant content, inspire them. So if they like a certain thing, don't give them the same thing again. Uh, an example I had was, I know they're talking about foundation, but uh, my example was when I worked for Shoppers Drug Mart, you know, when we first introduced, evolved our loyalty program, when someone... <laughs> bought vitamin D, we offered it up as a suggestion two weeks later until we became better at it, realized that, you know, frankly, you don't need vitamin to buy vitamin D every two weeks. So I know that was mentioned as part of, um, um, you know, beer and, you know, you don't, you don't need, you don't need um, Lucky Saint. If you've stocked up your, fr pan, your fridge, you don't need it every, every week, unless you that's a, well, that's a perfect segue into Emily, actually. So, Emily, um, I'm going to come to you next, if I may. Thank you, Sheila, for the perfect setup there. That was absolutely perfect. Um, we haven't talked about influencers yet, Emily. Um, and I was wondering how you use influencers to create the feeling that your product has been recommended personally to potential customers. Yeah, so I think um, similarly to what Shalom was saying, you don't want to be everything to everybody. And as a brand, you, you can only really speak from your standpoint. But with influencers, they know their own audiences really, really well. They know them intimately. And so they can, by partnering with them, they can communicate your brand messages in a way that really resonates with their specific audience. And it's a really good way, I guess, to, again, kind of segment the different audiences, whether that's an audience that's interested in healthcare or an audience that's interested in wellness or in food or um, in beer or, or any of these kind of focus areas. If you find an influencer that has a very specific audience and they can deliver your brand messages, your story, but in a way that really resonates with their audience it feels very personal um, and we found that that works in particular when it comes to our paid socials so on Facebook and Instagram um, when we use UGC videos so user generated content of an influencer giving a genuine testimonial of why they love our, our product those ads work much 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 better than a really beautiful ad that we've created that we might pat ourselves on the back for in the brand team because we think we've come up with some great line or some yeah. beautiful imagery. Um, but then you get an ad that's been filmed on an iPhone by themselves in selfie mode by an influencer and they're not delivering line by line your exact brand message. But we had one, for example, where it was um, a, a, a sort of fitness influencer. And she just talked to the fact that making small changes in her life had really impacted her health. And one of them was switching out alcoholic beer for Lucky Sane. And, you know, she didn't get in the 0.5 superior unfiltered lager line or, you know, the tasting is believing campaign line or anything like that. But she just spoke to a real truth for herself that really resonated with her audience. And that was a really successful ad for us. So I think using influencers is a really good way to make people feel like they've had that word of mouth recommendation from a friend. Um, because people do have that relationship with influencers online now. They feel like really invested in their life. Um, um, so I think it can be a really nice way, again, if you're, if you don't have that um, resource internally to personalize everything you do, getting a handful of influencers that you have a really great relationship with who can sort of do that for you um, can be a really cost effective, time effective way of, of making your brand feel personal to your customers. Yeah, and there's something about it. You know, thank you so much. There's something about influencers as well. When you get it wrong, you get it really wrong, right? So some disingenuous influence just pours out of the screen to me when I see it. And um, that's when you've given them a script, it doesn't yeah. work because everyone, people can sniff a script off a mile off. Like, you know, when yeah. someone's saying, I love this beer because it's 53 calories and it's vegan and it's low in sugar, like that doesn't resonate. Whereas if somebody says, do you know what? I used to have a beer every Wednesday after work because I felt so stressed, but now I just switch it for a lucky saint. That little story yeah, yeah. resonates way more than like reading all of your perfect, like perfectly copywritten brand lines, which is Absolutely. infuriating for a brand manager, but uh, is unfortunately the truth. <laughs> Thank you, Emily, so much. I'm going to come to the question, if I may, because Alan, it's been directed at you. Okay. Um, 
So it's um it's quite long, so I'm going to read it out. Um, this person is called LW. So whoever you are, LW, thank you very much. Um, question for Alan. Um, you said that C suiteers seldom define what they mean by personalization. So how do you define it? And do you have a rubric that you use to prescribe what should be done, for example, the various personality traits that you've decided to target? Did you get that? Yeah, I did. Um, I don't have a direct definition and I don't necessarily have a direct rubric, but I actually want to pick up on something that Shalom said about understanding the customer. What, and uh, Also playing off what Sheila said about a lot of the loyalty things that sit out there. Companies have a lot of data about what people do. So when I have got involved, um, I was a consultant in my prior, uh, before I joined Naxio, and when I was in doing consulting around personalization and stuff and those sort of things, one of the first things we do is take a, a complete step back and try and understand why people inter interacted with the brand in the first place. Not just what they did when they interacted with the brand, because we got lots of data around that, but actually try and understand why people interacted with the brand because you tend to interact with a brand because you personally have a need, be that for a product, a service, something, you know, you, you have a problem that needs fixing, you need to, you know, buy something, you, you want to, you know, lose weight, you want to look better, the, 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 you, there's something, there's some reason that you interact with a brand. So we take a step back and try and find out why people were interacting with the brand. And then to Emily's point about defining the mindset, figure out the mindset of the common actions that people took and what were those tasks that they were trying to fulfill and then build a personalization. I, I, I called it task-based personalization, um, but I, I, I think from now on, I'm gonna actually steal Emily's mindset thing because I think that's a better description of it, but actually find out what those common tasks that people were engaging the, with the brand for on the issues they were trying to solve and then build a personalization around that. So again, it comes back to what the Shalom said, not trying to be everything to everybody, but figure out a common need. And then who are the people that have that common need and then segment around that um, and then build your personalization strategy based on that. So I don't know if that actually answers the question. Um, but I'm sure it does. And thank you, LW. Let us know what you think of that answer as well. And thank you for getting involved. Um, incredibly, we are nearly an hour into this so we're going to have to start thinking about wrapping it up it feels like we've been talking for like five minutes um so um i'm going to come to a closing uh round of words if i may please for each of you and this is really just um parting top tips or words of wisdom really around this subject so on on the whole piece of personalization any diamonds nuggets of information that you would want to leave your audience with not just based on what you've talked about today, but based on your experience, uh, some, some closing words on this whole personalizing the customer experience piece from each of you. So Alan, you've got the longest to work out your answer. Nadine, I'm gonna jump in with you to start with uh, to take us through your top tips and closing words. Um, I think for me, it's all about co-creation, co-creation, co-creation. I think uh, companies should look at how they can, you know, what's their budget, how much resources do they have in terms of people or not? What's their priority? Is it content? Is it email? Is it influencer? Is it personalization? Is it increasing average order value? Whatever it is. And then go look for the solutions for that. I definitely think um, there's a lot of shopping happening on Instagram even nowadays. So in order to stay relevant and to maintain customers be loyal, uh, I don't see any other way to do that or achieve that without heavy personalization, to be honest. So I think it should become a number one priority. And I think it already is. I saw a report that came out that it's the number one priority for retail investment um, expected at least in 2022. So yeah, I think just educating and then just do it. There's, there's no like, you have to look into all this stuff for one year or have to hire 10,000 people. It's not the case yeah. more things have changed. Um, so yeah, that would be my, my nugget. Fine closing words indeed. And great to have you back with us today. And uh, thank you for your time on the panel. Um, Shalom, closing words of wisdom, please. Oh, closing words. It's been, it's been great. It's been like five minutes, as you said, Aaron. I mean, for me, it's really simple. It's know your market. Know your customer segment. Know what they want. Tailor your message. 
select the right images, know how you want them to feel, regardless of it's e-commerce or bricks and mortar. How do you want them to feel? What do you want to evoke in them? That's me. Well, and that is, that's not just you. That was a perfect, uh, succinct, band, but brilliant words of wisdom to close with. Lovely to see you again. Thanks for coming back and seeing us. Thanks, and lovely, lovely to see you guys doing so well as well. Sheila, come on then. Words of wisdom. Wrap it up for us. It's really hard to, to build on the, I'm just going to build on these great comments. Um, make sure there's a, there's a clear and um, aligned view of what success looks like when it comes to personalization. What is the end state going to be? And build a strategy um, where you're going to start, start somewhere and then, and then develop um, success criteria along the way because you're not going to get there overnight but you have to start somewhere and align on what that success looks like. How do you want the customer to think, think feel, and do as, uh, and build a plan and, uh, and develop alignment around it? Because without a clear alignment, you won't have the financial and human resources um, actively engaged against it. It'll be harder to achieve. Thank you so much. And listen, if you're in London, you have time for a coffee, hit us up and we'll, um, we'll, we'll hook up for a coffee, but enjoy your trip. Um, thank you. Thank you for your time on the panel today. Really appreciate it. Emily, give us those closing words, please. So just to build on what Sheila said about starting somewhere, I think for startups and small businesses, or maybe if it's just one person doing it on their own, personalization can sound really scary in the same way that data sounds really scary. And you think, well, I can't afford a load of data and where do I get all that data from? But you know something about your customers, even if it's how frequently they buy your product or the mindset that they're in, as we've said, like you do, you do have enough to personalize your marketing and the way that you approach your customers and the way that you get those sales. So I think start somewhere is a really good way to say it. As Sheila said, you, you have enough to, to do it. And it's not something that only massive companies and, and, and people with huge budgets can do. It's something that you can do. Um, and it's just about, you know, being in that right, getting the right mindset of your customer and yeah, starting somewhere. I'm going to steal Sheila's line. Thank you so much. Well, it's, it's, it's great. It's a great line to steal. And I'm sure we could all um, use that advice. Well, thank you for great closing words and lovely to see you again, Emily, as well. Alan, wrap it up in Texas for us then, please. I can't really beat Shalom's summary. That was excellent. Can we just put that copy and paste that and repeat that? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I would say, again, picking up on a couple of comments, you've already got a lot of the information out there. You've got images, you've got data, you've got content. Understand what you've got and then wrap it in a big bubble of empathy and understand your customer and deliver it to help them solve their problems. Thank you, sir. And thank you again to you for attending today, early morning in Texas, and to Nuxio for um, its sponsorship again as well. My um, pleasure. That's a wrap. Wow. I mean, thank you, Nadima, Shalom, Sheila, Emily, Alan, for all of your insights over the last hour. That did Zoom by. My fabulous five. You delivered perfectly. And the audience stuck around with us as well. You know how I obsess about that, right? So the audience stayed with us. So thank you, audience, indeed, for sticking around. And uh, we'll make the recording available later. So if you enjoyed it and wanted to watch it again to capture some things you may have missed or you want to share it with others, um, the recording will be available. From a fabulous five to a terrific two at four o'clock, we've got a closing panel of two today and we will be talking about um, UX and data-driven decision-making. Whoa, scary subject. Hopefully we'll unpack it in a plain English way for you. Um, but for now, thank you so much um, to my panel once again. Come back and see us at four o'clock. If you can't, 28th to September is another date for your diary. We're debating the future of the high street in another retail bulletin session. For now, thank you to my fabulous five. Thanks for staying with us and have a great rest of your Wednesday. Bye-bye.